Welcome to the Cinephiliac Lounge. I'm Pat O'Connell. And I'm Scott Kilroy. And we're two guys who like to talk about movies over a couple of drinks. Today we're talking about Thelma and Louise. Scott, could you give us a brief breakdown of the film? Sure. Warning, spoilers ahead. Directed by Ridley Scott and written by Callie Corey, Thelma and Louise tells the story of two women who try to go on a fishing trip only to be forced on to be on the run from the law when Thelma is almost raped by and Louise shoots and kills the would-be rapist. The two have various misadventures while attempting to avoid the police with the goal of sneaking into Mexico. Eventually, the two find themselves being chased by the local police as well as the FBI. Rather than surrender, the two decide to drive off a cliff to their deaths. Before we get into the movie, Pat, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking something I was unaware of. It was a recent gift from my friend, Blake. It is Michter's Small Batch Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Oh, I've had that. That's good. Yeah, distilled in small batches according to the Michter's Pre-Revolutionary War Quality Standard dating back to 1753. 91.4 proof. So I'm going to try this baby for the first time. Let's see his nose. No, I guess it's kind of like an amber color like most bourbons. The nose... Kind of light the smell, it just kind of smells like sweet, oaky corn, but subtle. Uh, I'm gonna take a nice little swill here. It's kind of like honey and uh, <laughs> I mean, vanilla, and I guess it's got a Good. It's subtle, but it's got a little heat and spice at the end, like a little peppery. Nice. Yeah, definitely hot. Liking it. What are you? Uh, what are you drinking today? I'm drinking something new today as well. I'm drinking 1792 Small Batch Bourbon. It's produced by the Sazerac Company for the Barton Distillery. It comes in a bottle that looks like it should hold perfume, <laughs> and uh, it's at 93.7 proof, and its tagline is, goes well with ambition. So let's see if that's the case. The color, it's got a kind of straw, golden, caramelly color. Nose, I'm getting a lot of vanilla and a bit of caramel. It's a taste. Wow, there's a lot of rye spiciness in this. And I'm also getting some caramel. And the finish is vanilla and a lot of rye. Ooh. It kind of reminds me of Buffalo Trace, but it's a little more subdued. Overall, not not bad, but nothing really stands out. There's also a 12-year expression and a single barrel expression that I was unable to find, but I've heard those are a little better. I also find it funny that I'm not a big fan of rye, but you give me a high rye content bourbon, and I really end up liking it. I, uh, I, I, I'm very deficient on, on anything rye. I think that's the next thing I got to try. I got to try some kind of rye bourbon. Yeah, it's not bad. I, I just end up going back to bourbon is what I find. So what were you drinking during the movie? Okay, so the, the movie, I was a little bit all over the place. I was just drinking my... At one point, I was drinking a... Because I watched, I watched the film a couple of times, and I watched the film with... I have the... DVD, so I watched a couple of times with commentary. They had one with the stars, Susan Sarandon and Gene Davis and the screenwriter Kelly Corey, and then they had one with Ridley Scott. So I had sat down with this movie a couple of times, and so I had my typical just get cores or whatever beer I was drinking. But then one night I was like, oh, you know, I want something nice. And I, I, for whatever reason, not that it goes with the film at all, I made a vodka martini with olives. Oh. And then at some point I was like, you know, this movie – this movie, what I should have been drinking was either some sort of tequila. Everybody drinks Miller. Well, most of the bad men drink Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Miller is a big part of this movie. So Miller, tequila. But the thing that I, that surprised me and I had forgotten because I've seen this movie many times before was Thelma, Gina, Gina Davis. She's obsessed. She gets obsessed and just starts drinking wild turkey throughout the film. So yeah. at some point while I was watching it, I, I, she, I had to. I went and, and dug up the what I had left of the uh, Wild Turkey 101. So I was drinking that with the movie. Cool. What about you? I was drinking something new for me, as well as the, the small batch bourbon I'm trying now. I tried something called Green Spot. I don't know anything about Irish whiskey. I've only had Jameson's. 
But this is a new Irish whiskey that just came out and it got a lot of really good reviews. And I saw it in the store. And I was like, I'm going to give it a try. And I have to say, it's pretty good. Very different than bourbon. It's really smooth, has some really nice flavors, but they aren't in your face. I definitely want to review it like for real in a, di- in a future podcast. Sounds good. I- I've only had Jameson myself. So yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. We should definitely, definitely do it for a future episode. Yeah, and Jameson's not bad. It's just it's kind of run of the mill. I don't I don't think there's a lot of flavor in there. So I just always had this like impression of Irish whiskeys as being kind of boring, but that's not the case apparently. Okay, well I'm gonna take another swill of uh, my Michter's small batch pre Revolutionary War recipe, and then let's um let's dive in. So do you remember where you saw this first? Okay. I looked through my archives. You know, we had a conversation earlier about how I, I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of stuff. Just ask my wife, who often gets annoyed with just how much space I take of this apartment with my junk. And I could have sworn I had a newspaper ad to try and look to, to remind myself of the actual theaters that I saw. I cannot. But I definitely saw this in the, the movie theater. I saw it many times. I think I saw it four times. I saw this, I think, as many times as a tombstone, which was about four times. I think most of them were all in Brooklyn. I don't know, but I do know for certain. I mean, I might have saw it at there was the Marlboro Theater, which no longer exists, which is on Bay Parkway. I saw almost all 80s films there because I lived at the time four blocks away from it. So I was happy as a pig and shit that I would only be four blocks away from the theater. I lived at that theater. But as I there... Or there's another theater on, on 86th Street, which is also gone, which was called The Oriental. But I definitely know the last time I saw this film on the big screen was at, was at Sheep's Head Bay at the UA Theater there. And this is definitely a film that needs to be seen on the big screen because the landscaping, the landscape and the scope of the film, it really adds to the majestic quality, especially by the end of the film, if you see it on the big screen. Did, when did you see it? Did you get to see it on the big screen? I'm really embarrassed to admit this. I haven't seen it. Until two weeks ago. Okay. I, I totally missed this when it came out. I don't know why. I wanted to see it. I remembered making plans to seeing it, and they fell through. And the next thing I knew, it was out of the theaters. And I, I had not ever seen it until you recommended it to me. Oh, well, that certainly happens. No one could get to it all. No one. There's plenty of films. The same as for, for me. I saw it. You know what a Ridley Scott fan, what a mark I am for him. So I had to see this on big screen. No, I understand. I wish I had seen it on the big screen. It looks great. And it's it's kind of a departure for him. I don't think I can think of any other movie he's done that looks like this. Yeah, the, the cinematography, he did this. Adrian Biddle was the cinematographer. Very good. And again... It really, it, you really can see it when you're, when it's on the big screen. I watch it on DVD. I'm like, oh, I need, I need a 4K restoration or 4K of this <laughs> movie, because you know, I was watching on DVD. I'm like, oh, this is like watching on Laserdisc, which I own this movie on Laserdisc, of course. Yeah, the cinematography on this film is fantastic. It everything, it, all Ridley Scott and Tony Scott films, whether they're good or bad, they always look polished and great. They always have great cinematographers. And yeah, this film is really beautiful. It's done so well. The stuff that they had to do to light certain sequences, they had shots of them. There's a lot of night shots in this film where you're they're, they're driving and you see it's all the trucks and highway. They had to have cars with lights on the cars to follow the cars so that the cars could be lit as well as they are. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah, the, towards I, I don't want to jump around too much, but towards the end, there's all those scenes where they're in the they're in the canyons that are just yeah. lit beautifully. I mean, it just I, I just imagine as a cinem- cinematographer, it must have been an equal part hell, but like fascinating and like really fun to light those scenes. No, absolutely. So one of the things I wanted to mention, I was looking into the kind of the notes about the making of this movie. Ridley Scott didn't want to direct it at first. Callie Corey, this is her first script, and she had a friend. I think she had a friend. Someone brought it to Scott Free Productions, and 
he initially it, they brought it to them. Her friend got it to to Scott Free to see if they could find someone that might be interested for foreign backing, financial backing. Okay. And then they read the script and like this is actually kind of good. And then Ridley read it and he was like, "This is really good." And he decided he wanted to produce it. And he was looking for di- directors and stuff like that. And in the there's a making of on the DVD. And he explains that he spoke to a lot of different people. Some of them, some directors, he just felt did not get the material. There were some people that he seriously considered. I know that Richard Donner was kind of in the lead. But, you know, Richard Donner would have done a fantastic job as well because he's done plenty of fantastic movies. Yeah, that uh, would have been really interesting. I, th- am I in my notes? That was the that's underlined. <laughs> Richard Donner. Yeah. Richard Donner can do the man can do action. Uh, you know the guy doing Lethal Weapon, doing Thelma Louise. The film would have been would have been good. It would have been funny. It would have been action packed. He would certainly do a great great job. You know, the guy did Superman. He did countless movies. I think I think what you said before that Ridley at some point said in the documentary that people kept asking him or people were leery. I thought was funny. People were leery like, this is so great. Why don't you want to direct it yourself? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and so at some point one of the actresses that he was talking to said the same thing and he just kind of said okay you know what maybe i should maybe i should do this and ridley scott proved with alien and blade runner and legend he, he is a man who could he can create a world a foreign world a future world an alien world he can do that this film showed that he could make the american landscape seem at once entirely familiar because they they filmed parts of this. They filmed, they didn't actually make the journey that the characters do in the film. They shot a lot of it in like Bakersfield, California and near LA. They did shoot in Utah and they shot in the Moab desert, which is close to Monument Valley. So a a lot of the stuff at the very end of the film feels, feels familiar because it is, we've seen those locations in countless other films, especially Westerns. And that lends something to the film itself using those locations in utah but the fact that that he was an englishman who did this american road picture his perspective was a little bit different and he he really focused and was inspired by things that an american an american director might not think twice about like telephone poles he he went on to, to say that you know he was fascinated by these long stretches of telephone poles but even by 91 so much of them had been gone and he found this one strip that is a shot in the film where it's kind of like kind of hazy but you see you know this stretch of telephone poles on either side for as far as i can see he worked really hard to find that location to get that shot oh interesting okay very cool yeah it it definitely has has a western feel to it by the way i was looking up who they were some of the original cast that were considered really weird. <laughs> I don't know if you looked at that. I did. I don't know you. The you want to bring up some of the names because I, I I saw we have some notes that we we talked about. So you had some names, but I had a, another set of names that you might not know about. So you go first. Okay. So the ones that I I found out about were Michelle Pfeiffer and Jodie Foster, which uh, that that's like the most realistic of them that I found. I found another another uh, they were considering Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn, which I honestly can't envision that at all. Yeah, both of those would have been very different films, and it's interesting that Michelle Pfeiffer and Jodie Foster is a weird mix. It could have you know worked. What's especially interesting about that is that fell through, right? Right. Yeah, there was it scheduling long, conflicts but... or something. Yeah. But Jodie Foster then went on to do Silence of the Lambs instead, which came out the same year as Thelma Louise. And all three, Jodie Foster and Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon, were all up for Best Actress Awards at the Oscars. And she wound up winning for Silence of the Lambs. So it's very, very interesting that it fell through for her. And yet it wound up the way that it did. I mean, Sons of Lamp's phenomenal movie as well. So oh, yeah. I think I think it worked out the best it could for film lovers. Yeah, I think you're right. So who who were some of the people you heard about? The interesting thing that I came across was Callie Cork 
in uh, the audio commentary and in the making of, she talks about how she initially, you have to give it to her, this was her first screenplay. So talk about hitting that out of the park first time at bat, because the script is is great. She, But when she brought it to, when they brought it to Scott Free, the whole idea was that she was looking to get some backing because she wanted to direct it herself. And in the commentaries and making of, you can see that it kind of still eats at her a little bit because she brings up, oh, you know, I, I want to do it. If I would have done it, it would have been very different, though. I would never have had that money. Like in the auto commentary, every time something comes up, she's like, you see, you see how many like jet helicopters and that jet. If I had done it, I would I would that wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to do that scene because I wouldn't have that money. I wouldn't have that right. money. But the thing that she brought up is she was thinking Holly Hunter and Francis McDormand. Huh. Which that would have worked. <laughs> yeah, that would have worked. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you. That that definitely would have worked. But the film as it stands, I, I think works beautifully with the two actresses that got the parts. Both of them, both of them are, are great in the film. They're fun. They're smart. They're on point. Everything. It's so the movie is bizarre in the sense that it is this. It is a very, it is a very it is on the one hand a very mainstream film, right? Right. But on the other hand, it's not in the stuff that it's handled. You know, the, one of the things one of the things that I liked about the film and was this movie at its heart. This is a seventies movie, and I love seventies movies. Like, this is a seventies film that's wrapped in a glitzy nineties uh, mainstream package. It's it does huh. it's not a Hollywood ending for that no, time. No, not at all. For that time period, not at all. This is a 70s film ending. And I I adore 70s films because of how gritty, fun, and fucked up and <laughs> depressing many of the films of the 70s are. <laughs> but I, I, re, I, I really respond to that. And it's funny, when I told I told some people that we were doing, we had conversations about doing this film for the podcast, and I, I brought up to a friend of mine, George, and also Gina, they were, they were a little shocked or taken aback that when I said that I, that I love this movie, really? I don't know huh. why I was like, really? Like kind of like confused. Like really that movie? I'm like, no, it's, it's great. Yeah. I mean, it looks phenomenal. It's like, wh- wh- why wouldn't you understand it? I mean, I'm a really Scott guy. Uh, and this is really Scott. And uh, going back to what we were saying, this is really Scott visually being the visual stylist that he always in his always is in his films. And that helps to elevate the material to a certain state. If, if it had been done as a smaller film like Callie Corey had envisioned, the issues, the sociological issues, the feminist issues or concerns that the film is, uh, problems and issues that they're addressing, they would all still be there, but it would feel very different. Yeah, it would. It, yeah, I have trouble imagining her, you know, what she what she imagined the movie what it was going to be because it, yeah. it just works so well is what it is and it's really funny it's one of those movies when i was writing the synopsis for it the plot for this is actually kind of elegant like it's simple but like in an elegant way yes. you know what i mean like it, it it's not convoluted at all it's 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 very much like in the, the in the vein of typical buddy road movie absolutely it is a buddy road film it is a outlaw film just happens to have two women in the lead instead of the typical two men. It, as I said before, it feels like a 70s film. Be, the premise, the plot that you have. Uh, Thelma is this childish, innocent, naive housewife whose husband, Daryl, is a philandering asshole to her. And Louise is her like waitress best buddy. And they go to the Hills of Eyes. They go, they, they not exactly horror, but they, they go to, to have a, a weekend getaway. And it turns into this whole other thing. And the mood, the mood does shift in the film. Like once they, them wants, wants to go get a drink and they wind up at the Silver Bullet restaurant. And the scene where the guy Harlan has got she's all drunk and been dancing and kind of flirting or whatever and then he brings her out and then he starts to try and like kiss her and make something happen it gets fucked up and scary there is a moment where he's hitting and you're like this is it gets it gets a little hard to watch oh yeah and it's amazing that they could do that and then louise stops him because thelma has taken daryl's gun because she's taken everything but the kitchen sink with them they need that for the story obviously but the fact that it, it gets very dark because she stops him. You think that's it. And he just has to push it and say, like, she tells him in the future when a woman's crying like that, she's not having any fun. 
and he can't help but be an asshole. I was like, bitch, I should have gone ahead and fucked her. And she just loses her mind, says, what'd you say? And shoots him. The fact that they're able to turn it and then you're able to have comedy 10 minutes later is, and for it to feel organic is pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that it does turn, I, I did like, I knew about the movie, so I knew certain things were going to happen, but I, I was not prepared for her to shoot him at that point. I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but I was very surprised when she, when she shot him. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Gina, I think it's Gina Davis describes in the one of the making of that I watched. She said that she had, she would sneak into theaters in the back of theaters because she, she was really she was really psyched about this movie. She's just like really loved this movie. She loved shooting it. She loved being part of it. She loved watching audiences react to it. And she said she went to cons with Ridley Scott and they're showing the film. And it's just, it was quiet. And they started to get nervous. You know, maybe it is so quiet. We're bombing here. Wow. And it got to that scene. And when, when Louise shoots Harlan in the chest, the theater erupted at cons like they just wow. lost their mind so it, it certainly taps into a, a primal feeling for 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 women and for men if their heads are screwed on straight <laughs> right <laughs> yeah it's really funny because looking at this and then looking at birds of prey we're like we picked two movies where like they're well this movie does have one good male character in it which i'll get to in a minute <laughs> But we picked movies where there's really nobody. Um, and in, in uh, Thelma and Louise, of course, Hal Slocum, played by Harvey Keitel, is the only man in the movie that has any sympathy towards these women, like or any understanding of what they might have gone through. Oh, I, I, I disagree. You're forgetting about Michael Madsen. Jimmy. Jimmy's a cool-ass cat. Ah, but... Yes, Jimmy's a cool ass cat, but he does not follow directions. <laughs> he was told to leave the money, and this is something I didn't catch this on the first first watching. I caught this later. It's it, it's not really spelled out, but he gives them up. They know that he brought them. He brought the women six thousand dollars because at one point, Harvey Keitel's character said when they catch JD. And he's got the $6,000 on him. He says, oh, yes, which Jimmy had told us he had brought the women so they could escape to Mexico. So he's not he's not as good of a guy as he as you would think. <laughs> OK, point taken. I think I would have to rewatch it. I re I watched deleted scenes and outtakes as well. And I and they do have a scene of them interrogating jimmy and i think that they arrive at i, I don't want to go on record if, for the record anyone who's a thumb louise expert please excuse me if i'm incorrect but <laughs> i think in the uh, one of the outtakes or the deleted scenes they the cops arrive at the they figure out the amount of money that he's found with corresponds to amount of money taken out okay or something yeah so i get what you're saying There's no i I just saw it as... Yeah, the film as it stands, you you would have to think, well, yeah, J you know, Jimmy Jimmy is picked up by the cops. And J.D., Brad Pitt's character, J.D. is picked up by the cops. So they figured it out from the two of them. Yeah. But but for the most part, he's 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 not a perfect character. He's a flawed man. But he's at at his... It's not like... No, I know what you're saying. He's, yeah, he's it's not... It's not like a Birds of Prey where there's no one. There, I mean, there is not one man in Birds of Prey that's worth a fucking damn. All no, no, I, I, I hear you. It's, he's not that bad. It's just... I, I don't know. I always... Any any movie where there's the law involved, I, I kind of slip into this like mode of... Um, like I'm a character from Goodfellas or something. Like you don't talk to the cops. <laughs> don't fucking rat. You don't rat. <laughs> Snitches so, get stitches. Yeah, you know? exactly. So I saw I saw Jimmy's betrayal as I saw it as a betrayal, <laughs> probably more than the normal person watching this movie would. <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. It's a valid point. It's a valid point. But he 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 does go out of his. He does he does he tries to do the right thing. Fair enough. Yeah, he does. He tries to do the right thing. By the way, I got to mention one side note. As you know. I don't, I don't, the listeners probably don't know, but as you know, I'm a huge Harvey Keitel fan. Love him and everything, but 
God, he's trying that accent out. It was killer. <laughs> I don't know where the hell he was supposed to be from, but he was. it was like Brooklyn by the way of the Deep South. Well, you know, it's just like when he did uh, Last Temptation of Christ, where everybody was just like, yeah, yeah, it's 2,000 years ago, but we talk like this. That's the way it was. <laughs> That's how we talked 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. It's a thing. I get what you're saying. But he, he, he's great. I mean, I, I love Harvey Keitel. He's, you know. There's a sequence in there which cracks me up that is completely him. Well, two things. In the scenes where he's laughing at Chris McDonald being Daryl, that's really just him laughing. Like, from, Oh, really? You know, yeah, Chris McDonald was apparently cracking Harvey Keitel the fuck up during this movie. And uh, Gina Davis, I, it seems like everybody loved, everybody loved Chris McDonald in this movie. Really? Like, huh. Yeah, Gina Davis points out. I I came across Gina Davis in the commentary talks about how how good he is as Daryl and how fun or whatever. I think that they used to date, like they were like ex girlfriend and boyfriend, and wound up in this movie. But weird, huh? Yeah, because he's a he's a bastard in the in the movie. He plays a bastard in the movie. Yeah, it is interesting. Daryl is such a douchebag in the film, but the as you said, the actor everyone seemed to love. In fact, Ridley apparently. Loved to use accidents and improvisation and really, really encourage a free willing, free wheeling air in the, with the actors. But apparently that scene where he comes out of the house to get into his car when he leaves Thelma in the morning. Okay. And he he kind of slips on the wood. And he's like, God damn it. I don't need to shit in the morning. He's like, you get out here by two, by three. No, by, by two. That was the first take. He actually fell. And like bumped his head pretty good, and everything that he said in that particular scene was completely ad libbed. Oh, that's funny. It seems completely like organic and was written or or planned, but it absolutely was not. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah, yeah. Hats off to him. I mean, he he played a complete like you had. There's no sympathy for that character at all. <laughs> He's like a jackass from the second he comes on the screen to the. Last scene he said. Well, he, he he almost redeems. He almost seems like he gets it in that last shot towards the end of the film where they, they kind of dolly into him like about to cry in his living room next to that. Did you notice the, the set design in this movie is fascinating and amazing. He was about to he say he's about to cry. He's next to that. They have a fucking lamp that have goldfish in it. Did you catch that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like a and a seventies pinball machine because like I said, this movie at its heart really is a seventies film. But yeah, Christopher McDonald, Christopher McDonald. I mean, everybody was was great. I agree with you on Harvey Keitel. Kind of, it was a little bit of a stretch for him to be from Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, just a little. But he, you know, that's fine. I, I could accept it. You know, sure. He he does something. Oh, uh, there's a couple of things, uh, and I always do this where. We talk for a little bit, and then I rem remind, I'm reminded of something I want to go back to. There's a sequence that he, speaking of happy accents or improvisation, there was always, when he goes to, when Hal Slocum, Harvey Keitel's character, breaks into Louise's apartment, he checks, there's this whole thing about how, you, you see in the movie how fastidious Louise is, and how everything has to be perfect and clean. And he like checks to see her table is like, you know, spotless and clean. And he looks, and he picks up a photo and he says, and it always cracked me up. And apparently he totally ad libbed it where he picked up a photo, which is really a photo of Susan Sarandon at that age. And he says, have a birthday lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And going it, it, by the way, it reminded me of how obsessed I am with Blade Runner. Apparently really is also because there's a good portion of the commentary for Thelma Louise where Ridley Scott is talking about Blade Runner. Fascinating. <laughs> really? But okay. I'll have to pick this up. You have to listen. To it. It's great. Like he, he talks about, because he talks about how much fun he had on this shoot. Like he's like, he really had a great time shooting this film. Like he, 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 he was paranoid at how well it was going and how everyone was enjoying themselves. And he says like, it's the complete antithesis of the set for Blade Runner. And the only reason why I'm bringing this up, 
because, you know, one, I'm obsessed with Blade Runner, but two, that sequence where he picks up the photograph of Gina Davis and he's happy birthday, lady. They do this audio thing of children laughing. So they kind of make you think or you kind of hear or there's this weird, subtle thing of somehow hearing her as a child. And it something that he does in Blade Runner when Rick Deckard looks at Rachel's photograph and for a split second, the photograph, the light moves like it comes to life and you hear sound, the subliminal sound of what the experience was or what was going on at the moment when the photo was taken. And that's also in them, but he doesn't touch upon that, which I also found fascinating. Oh, that's a cool, that's a cool effect too. Wow. Huh? Yeah. Oh, so one thing I did want to bring up JD Brad Pitt. Yeah. That was his first acting major role, as far as I know. I know he was in 21 Jump Street in the background, but I don't think he was in any movies until this point. That memory serves correct. At one point, they wanted, I think they wanted Michael Madsen to play the, initially wanted Michael Madsen to be Harlan. And he's like, I won't play that guy. And he got to play Jimmy. And I may be messing this up. They had someone else in mind to be JD. I I, I think George Clooney tried out for that role really okay yeah. i had the notes i found was that it was originally going to be played by billy baldwin okay which eh, i guess i don't know not a big billy baldwin fan my not that my bread is buttered on that side or anything but if you if you're going to talk about who's man prettier brad pitt from then is going to win like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I mean, you're right. And that sex sequence with Thelma, you're like, Jesus. And that six pack is ridiculous. By the way, I think you know, Gina Davis, I think, was abs- was smitten with Brad Pitt. I don't blame her. Yeah, sure. Why not? And there's there's a in the making of the like really Scott was like, oh, at some point he's he's like, oh, we got to do this sex scene, love scene. And so he started interviewing body doubles. And Gina Davis was like, what? Why are these people like coming to your trailer or whatever? And really, Scott like describes like it was a very bizarre thing to cast that because it's like okay, well I was cast a body but double. It, it it seemed like it was like weird. But it was like oh yes, um, would you mind taking off your shirt so we see how you look naked? Right. <laughs> Hollywood baby, Hollywood. But <laughs> <laughs> Gina Davis apparently was got hip to this, and she's like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm casting body double." And she's like, "You don't need to do that." Well, hell, no, I'll do it myself. Probably because she thought that Brad Pitt was pretty attractive, you know? (laughs) Yeah, why the hell not? (laughs) Yeah, sure, why not? I saw the outtakes of stuff that they didn't use. Crazy. I read something. I don't know if it's true or not, but I read something really quickly. I think it was today I came across that the outtakes of the sex scene apparently won some sort of soft porn prize. I don't know if that's (laughs) bullshit or not. All right, we'll have to look into that. Well, have to... Must be explored. Yeah, we we need to know the the truth behind that. <laughs> but I thought he was very good. He was perfect for the role. If you're gonna have if you're gonna have the the lone drifter guy that Dumb is gonna be into, he would have to be attractive. And you have to, it's amazing in this film is it's 1991, and at the end of the film, I, I wrote it down somewhere. But when the cops are chasing her, the FBI, you hear their date of birth, and even though that Louise very much seems much older, and she's very much there's a at the outset of the film, it's very much a mother-daughter relationship, even though they're best friends between right. Louise and Thelma. They're only like a year apart. So there's a secret. And watch it. I've seen this movie many times. Like I said, couple, four times at least in the theater. Owned on Laserdisc. Owned it on DVD. I've seen this movie many times. But caught this time that it or it sank in when JD asks her in the car. You know, he at some point he's asking her, "How come you you know you married? Why don't, why don't you have kids?" She she mentions that she she got married at eighteen, and she had been dating Daryl for four years. Right. So it's like a seventies film. It's like, oh yeah, I met him when I was a fourteen, and then we got married. <laughs> <laughs> so that not really an emotionally or it, that being said, she's worried. You could see that this why she's not as developed in her personality as maybe Louise is if she's been with Daryl since she was 14. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, there were points in the movie where I would get genuinely mad at her because she would just do something really dumb. And then I would have to kind of remind myself, wait, she's really sheltered. She's really sheltered. She's really naive. I mean, I, I agree with you. Uh, everything transpires in this film because, <laughs> because she does because something stupid. 
she it, she continually does stupid things or, or stupid naive makes stupid and naive mistakes, which propels the, the you know, the plot and the, and the story forward. But if she had, if she had not done, if she had did one less mistake, the movie, the, the end result could have been different. Yeah. It, yeah. It was funny. Cause I, I, I kept going, it was, it was really funny. I would get mad at her. And then I kept remembered. I don't know if you ever heard uh, Sam Raimi talk about, making movies no and he said you can't have a movie unless someone does something stupid <laughs> yeah i guess you're right yeah and it's like yeah i guess yeah i guess it kind of that tracks well this movie she does several stupid things <laughs> leaving the money with jd was really hard for me to like forgive her for <laughs> yeah that was that was one expensive orgasm six thousand six hundred dollars worth but it seemed like, but, but judging by her face, when she goes to see Louise at the diner right after, I guess it was worth it. I guess so. Um, what else? What else about that film? It might be jumping around too far, but I could tell you one thing I didn't like about the movie. The okay. end where it turned into Dukes of Hazard for a few minutes. <laughs> like the car chase where the cop cars are just crashing. and it, You don't like that? I didn't think it needed it. it, it I, I didn't mind it. I, I enjoyed okay. it. First of all, it looks it looks great. When they're going through and they clip that one cop car and the 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 side mirror goes flying in slow motion. It's got some good shots in there. And the the, the, the that overhead kind of crane shot where you see them going towards the top of the screen and then slowly you see the fourteen cop cars trailing behind them. I think okay. it's a way of it's it's a way of bringing action toward another action sequence without having um people die or get shot at or something explode. I didn't mind it. Okay. No, fair enough. But I but I love I love smoking I could watch smoking a bear every day. <laughs> the, that see, this goes back to what I said. This movie is a seventies film. See that's a seventies thing to do. Yeah, you got a good point there. It is very seventies. It is very seventies, and the 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 extended chase sequence, the action sequence of cars, that is a very seventies thing. Smoking the Bandit, any number of things, and it also ties into other road, other road films that also have fucked up weird endings. And this is what I like. I don't know if you ever seen the movie Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry. No. Oh, that's a good one. And Vanishing Point. It's also an extended road movie that's fucking. Ends up in a 70s fucked up ending. No, I haven't seen that either. I have to admit, I, I'm not as versed on the 70s movies as you are. Oh, God, I love them. I love them. I just... The the thing that's amazing, the, the vein of 70s insanity is so rich. I'm still mining it. I, I'm still come across. I still find... I still find 70s movies I've never even fucking heard of before. I'm just like, holy shit. This is great. Love it. Love it. Cool. But but also, the other way that this movie is very 70s, and I love it, and it's there are two sequences where it's used very well, is zoom-ins. This movie brings back the 70s zoom, because there's a sequence when Thelma, it cost her six six thousand six hundred dollars to have the orgasm and learn how to be how to be a rob how to rob convenience stores and liquor stores from jd once that's discovered and she fucking louise loses it and she takes control and it's like okay i'm gonna fix this and she stops by roadside and you don't see you stay with louise and she's in the car and she's been crying and she's just all fucked up and she's now she's in the passenger seat you know thelma is the one who's driving the story and the car now and louise is in, 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 she takes lipstick and she's about to like put it on and she she looks she looks across the street to the house or whatever and in the window there's this slow zoom in of this old woman two old women do you remember this no i don't this is weird okay so yeah i this this scene always resonated with me and i loved it i knew there was just something about it that i fucking loved she's louise is sitting there and she just sees these two old women through a window and it, the it's a slow zoom in not a dolly a zoom in to them and the old woman got a fucking wig and she's kind of she looks sad and she kind of it zooms in and she kind of almost imperceptibly tries to smile at louise 
And huh. it's just, it's a haunting shot and you don't need it. You don't need it. You could take it out and someone would, but it, it adds, it layers something to the film. And it, I, I always, after watching so many times, I always thought of it as Louise looks, she almost sees into the future because she's, she sees two women and you almost think like, Oh, this is what Louise, if they didn't, if they didn't have this happen to them and they went back to fucking bumfuck Arkansas where they were and she went back to asshole Daryl and she went back to not, you know, to, to, to being just dating Jimmy for another 10 years, they would wind up being these two old women with too much makeup, just like sad, lone with empty lives. And she, when she, after that, then she goes to put on lipstick and she like, looks. she just gives it and she throws the lipstick away. Oh, wow. I, I got to watch this again. I kind of remember the scene, but it, did, it didn't have that effect on me that it did on in you. And they build upon that scene, in my opinion, later, and we'll get to it, about when Louise start, has that barter sequence with the old man for her jewelry for the hat kind of thing. And it, it, it continues on something that when we start talking about themes and motifs that I'll, I'll would, would touch upon, but it, it certainly builds the movie. The, the script is very good because they didn't change the script. They didn't bring other people. They didn't, the only thing that happened is they cut stuff out, but they didn't fuck with the script as it was, which is also very amazing. And hats off to Callie Corey. So, you know, they just nipped and tucked. They didn't huh. change anything. They just cut back. But so the zoom in the other time that the zoom in is used and it's also very important is at the end of the film when they decide, fuck it, let's just keep driving, right? Right. You got fucking FBI helicopters. There's no way out of this. And they, 70s, fuck it, let's just drive. Are you sure? Yeah. And they, they have, it's that sequence, it's shot beautifully. It's fucking great. Also, the, the, the filming of that, they did two takes and they were losing the light. And in the second take that he got, and he's like, okay, I think we got it. He said, cut. And Gina Davis, Susan Sarandon claims that the sun literally went out. Like it just like it, it turned as soon as they were done shooting that sequence. Wow. She was like, it was almost like it was like it was meant to be. So it's pretty fucking great. But that sequence where she's like, okay, we're going to do this. And she, she gives that beautiful non-sexual, just like, like last kiss of life to her friend before they're going to drive off the cliff. And, when they grab each other's hand, there's the zoom into the hands. And then there's the zoom into the original Polaroid that they took together, which also shows how much they, tra- there's movies, when I get to themes and motifs, transformation is a very big part of this film. And you see that, what's supposed to be that first Polaroid that they take at the beginning of the film, which is used for the poster and all this other stuff for the marketing of the film. And you see a zoom in as you see that one photo fly out of the car. So there's actual... There is a piece, a remnant of of the legend of Thelma and Louise that, that will stay with history in that photograph. So he uses zoom-ins for important, very subtle and psychological things like with the old women, but then for very important things at the very end of the film. Love the zoom-in. No, I totally caught the end of the film. I did not catch the thing with the old woman. But yeah, I, I totally see what you're getting at with the at the end the other thing is there's so much in this movie that i like and i mean it it is a female buddy road movie and it does it has a very modern western feel you know there are two female desperados on the run to mexico and i also like that it it has important and and relevant issues and a modern feminist perspective but it never it it never succumbs to being militant or or a diatribe whatsoever oh it managed to keep a balance it it keeps an amazing balance between being serious and being funny and always being entertaining always looking gorgeous the movie looks gorgeous and the editing is amazing there's there's a sequence uh i love this the editing sequence the editing in this film is fucking spot on as is the as is the score um, I, you got to give a shout out to fucking Hans Zimmer, who has become one of my favorite guys. He's always does solid fucking work, but he this is an early one by him. And it's great. The score that he did. And but going back to the editing, uh, Tom Noble edited the film. And there's a sequence that I particularly like where following that sequence, that I talked about the two old women and she throws the lipstick away. And then Thelma comes running like, please drive, get the hell. Because she's just fucking robbed the place. And she jumps <laughs> in and, and she's like, what the fuck did you do? She's like, I robbed. And she's like, oh, my God. She's like, well, what'd you say? She's like, well, I just walked in and I said, and then fucking hard cut to 
Harvey Keitel, uh, you know, Hal Slocum and Daryl and Stephen Tobolowski is Max, the FBI guy. They're watching the surveillance footage. Right. And Thelma picks up from there. I was like that. I was like, that was great. I was like editing the editing just added to the the humor and advanced the storyline immediately. So well done with one cut. Yeah, that was very cool. Oh, the one thing I want to talk about, what, as I said, what I liked in, about this film or find interesting is, and I, I may have said this before, but people people are surprised that I, I that I that I love this movie so much for some reason, and and even Gina I think was was a little taken aback, like you know what you know what wanted to know why I responded to this, and I and I came across a couple of things like I respond to this film because. It is a film about regular blue collar people finding power and freedom from the chains that society has put on them. Not just not just women. Like it is about women. But what I responded to is 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 that for people in general. I mean, that's what people what that's what people find liberating and fun in outlaw films, in my opinion. It is that freedom. And then Callie Corey, I saw, said something in the audio commentary that pointed to that, just that it, or, or, or elaborated on what I thought, why I responded to this film so much. And she said, it is a way of finding outlaw films, or it's a way of finding justice in a world where there is no justice, which I thought was a very succinct way of, of putting it. Huh. You know, part of the reason why I love this film so much. And then also Ridley also said something in his in the audio commentary that I was like, yeah, you know that that must that must be what what it tapped into in me. It's, he said that in a way, the film has a hugely attractive quality. He thinks because the story and the way the film came out, which is really about freedom. Yeah, yeah, I could see that totally. You know, we should talk about 1991 in general when this movie came out. Is there was something going on that year? There was it was really a good year for strong female leads in action films and thrillers. You know, there are a bunch about escaping or eliminating abusive and dominating men. Let's see, I have a list here. Yeah, what came out? I don't even remember what came out that year. I looked into it because I remembered that obviously Sons of the Lambs came out and that definitely connected to this film between the Oscars, Oscar race and the fact that Jodie Foster was, was going to be in Thelma Louise at some point. But there were a number of films. There was that Sally Field movie, Not Without My Daughter, where she's trying to escape her abusive husband. Like, oh, right. And they go back to Iran or something, and she's trying to escape from him. And then they had Sleeping with the Enemy. Remember that one? Yep. I rem didn't see it, but I remember it. I may have seen it on VHS. Back then, I watched a lot of stuff. Stuff that I would never bother with today just like oh, i don't have time for that but yeah so sleep with not without my daughter came out in january then they had sleeping with the enemy in february then la femme nikita a luke Besson film that came out in march and that was awesome yeah that was a lot of fun yeah i never bothered with the tv show but the original film i loved i saw that at the angelica i think that's where i saw it too then oh there was the demi moore and bruce willis one mortal thoughts was also about bruce willis as the asshole husband and her and her friend are forgetting the actress at the moment but then of course there was terminator 2 judgment day which came out in july okay that was a big one yep that's a big one and this wasn't a big you know particularly big one but it still fit into a, a woman action lead at vi warshawski with the uh, kathleen turner film oh was that any good i saw it on vhs i don't okay. think i saw it in the theater i saw it on vhs do not remember a single fucking thing <laughs> <laughs> that good that good but but whatever it is good or bad oh here's a funny one I, not even on my list but i did see this i actually put it in a paper i did a paper for a class science fiction class called Fe female automatons in the sci-fi film i examined blade runner metropolis cherry 2000 i don't know if you know that one no oh but melanie griffith it's like a cheapo like almost like straight to video kind of but but good low budget independent film of a future where most men have r robot girlfriends or wives and his, his cherry 2000 breaks down. But in order to get parts, he has to go into the wasteland and he has to get, you know, a guide. And that guide is Melanie Griffith. Weird. Yeah. So that, and then the other film I included in the, in that paper was Eve of Destruction. It was a Gregory Hines film where there was the female robot that looked human, but, and I don't remember why, but for whatever reason, she goes rogue and she has a nuclear weapon inside of her. <laughs> <laughs> 
As most robots would. Sure. As most robots do. Yeah. In any case, I don't know what was in the water in 1991, but I guess it... It was time for women to try and have their day, uh, at least on the big screen. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I didn't even realize Silence of the Lambs came out at the same year until we started researching Thelma and Louise. Yeah, and I love Silence of the Lambs. It's great. That also had its anniversary. That came out February 14th. Okay. There were a couple of notes I had about some some anecdotes, behind the scenes stuff that I thought was was interesting in, when I, in various audio commentaries and the making of that was on the dvd the car of course is very important they're in that car for most of the film the 1966 green thunderbird the t-bird convertible yeah they had a bunch of those but one of them caught fire within the first couple of days of shooting three were actually thrown off the cliff okay and apparently two of them and it's funny in the commentary with Susan sarandon gina davis and callie Corey, they talk about it and they're like, oh, I wish I could have done like, oh, yeah, well, those two went to Ridley's sons. So Ridley Scott's sons each got a, a fucking 1966 T-Bird out of this. <laughs> nice to be uh, nice to be one of his kids. Yeah. The other thing the other thing that I thought was very interesting, and it ties into the impact that the film had socially and culturally, but in sexual politics of it, is that Ridley Scott, apparently the Earl, the, the gross can truck driver that that they keep coming across that's driving in that giant phallic symbol chrome tanker yep. truck. So his hat and his glasses, Ridley Scott bought them, both those items, from an actual trucker. Oh, really? <laughs> That's what he claims. He claims he saw it and he's like, I gotta have that hat. And he saw the glasses on some other guy and they didn't find it and he just, he bought it off some real trucker. So he's wearing shit that actually was worn <laughs> by truckers. That's hilarious. Yeah, and that also goes, there's a, there's this, looking at this time, the, you know, the, the Earl's hat that she gets takes after they blow up the, the tanker and it's kind of like, uh, you know, her her trophy is to take his hat. And they both of the both of the women have sequences where they literally take the hat, like a symbol power, from a man. One is done by one is done by bartering and okay. peacefully, and one is done violently. So the the truck driver hat blow up the tank, and then Delma grabs it when they circle around him. Apache warpath when they circle around him to kick up dust. But his hat is interesting because. It has an American flag and it has a pin of the mud flap girl that, that is on his back of his truck. That they're like, oh my God, why did I do that? But the the American flag is, is on that hat. And there's a sequence when Louise is walking. She she gets off the phone with ranging with Jimmy. You got to wire me, get me this money. And he tells her to go to the Vagabond Hotel. And she's walking and it's a throwaway shot. But it's, it's a, just, just some rando dude and he's got no shirt. Totally gross, drinking a drinking a Miller, because all dudes drink Miller in this movie. <laughs> and he has the, the he doesn't have a shirt, but he, he does have an American flag bandana. So it's these all these weird things of America and asshole men are associated. Oh, weird. And there's actually an article that you sent me last night when I was looking through it. It mentions something I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. And in the sequence where they go to the diner, there's a lot of the color scheme in the background or whatever. There's a lot of red, white, and blue. So there's a lot of weird infusion, subtle or not so subtle. But the other thing I would say is, and it's tied to another little anecdote that I thought was interesting, is when they go to that town and Louise is she is making the strips, the jean strips, to be like almost like a bolo tie and wetting it down, like a noose around her neck. Right. And she sees a really old dude sitting there, and she walks over and she takes the jewelry or whatever and she barters for his hat so right. louise gets a hat through divesting herself of her rings and jewelry and stuff like that and louise takes a man's hat his symbol of who's wearing the hat through violence but that dude that old cute old like muppet man that they that she goes to he doesn't say anything she just says hello that guy lived in that town apparently where they shot it was a uranium mining town okay and he <laughs> was 95 and had a Scott said, talking to him, he said he had stopped mining uranium at fucking 90. Wow. <laughs> so I just, that, that, that really tickled me pink. Yeah. Has a, has a long career in right, mining uranium, then gets to be in a movie. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad at all. What else? Oh, you know, Ridley, if you read other things like shoot a Blade Runner and how controlling he, he is and how he's more con- was con- more concerned about visuals and anything else, he's apparently was very different on this set or 
at least people said he that he I told you he he loved to use the accents improvisation and Christopher McDonald, but he also would just he would be inspired stuff that Rastafarian you see that's on the bike that comes along and blows smoke into the the trunk at the the cop that's trying to escape that was not in the script whatsoever. He had seen a dude cycling through where they were shooting in the Moab desert, and he just thought that was great, and he just added that in as a afterthought as just a joke and this movie shows when he wants to he's actually quite good at comedy yeah i mean that's it's hilarious you know you see the guy go over and you're like you're not sure what he's gonna do and he just blows smoke in the hole yeah. i love it. it takes its time to get there too yeah like he doesn't he doesn't go up to the car immediately he's just chilling listen to his beat. good stuff Every time I saw it in the theater, everyone always laughed at the same beats, and that was one of them. Yeah, that's hilarious. There was a couple of things watching it this time. Oh, but one of the really Scott, and I don't know, have you ever seen Terrence Malick's Badlands? Oh, yeah. Love Badlands. Well, Ridley said that when he was doing this film, he very much related to, while he was shooting and thinking of Terrence Malick's Badlands, which kind of makes sense. It's They're not exactly the same kind of film, but he, he brought up something about how, like, he, he was fascinated about how you could get people who are doing wrong things and yet still be so likable. You can get the audience to empathize. In Badlands, they really, I mean, they, they kill their, the girl's parents. And yeah. So, because in this film, if you want to be technical, they did, ki- I think he deserved it, but they do, ki- you know, you could say they killed Harlan in cold blood. She had stopped them. Yeah. So it's, it's not exactly as vicious and crazy as, as Badlands. But I thought that was very interesting that he, that he was very much inspired by ter- and thinking of Terrence Malick's Badlands when he's doing this film. I could kind of see it. I, I could see that. And you're right. They, I mean, Harlan wasn't really a threat at that point. I mean, he was a threat earlier in the in the scene. But at that point, he was pretty much under control. He just had to be a wise-ass and open his mouth. And if he, if he kept his mouth shut, he wouldn't have got shot. Yes. I, and it, it doesn't excuse watching the film and you realize towards the end of the film that they the film t- gets to, in my opinion, it explains a lot of Louise's behavior when Thelma figures out that the reason why she refuses to go through Texas is because she was raped in Texas. And once you know that something, and you can see that she's still not, she still has not come to terms with it because she, well, she refuses to discuss the matter even right. with her best friend. She's like, I'm not going to talk about that. And she shuts it down. Like immediately. She doesn't have a whole like crying. Like she's like, no, I'm not talking about this. But I feel that the movie in very subtle or not so subtle ways does explicitly talk about it. Once you know that that happened to her and you watch the movie again, I caught some what I thought were like, oh, that's some telltale signs. So him saying that and pushing her, she's lashing out because she still has never gotten over, which is completely understandable. But she's never gotten over what happened to her in Texas. So it is understandable, at least to me. Wasn't uh, We'll get to that later. Not to some critics, but to me. <laughs> and I thank you. <laughs> but th- there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on here that I like when I looked at it. This is, this is a, a female outlaw film. It's a, it, it's a buddy film. But in a lot of respects, it is a modern Western. And there are a lot of uh, obvious and not so obvious allusions and nods to Westerns. Like Louise's outfit at the very beginning, which they're getting to go. She's going to meet Thelma to pick her up to go on this fishing trip. Her outfit is very Western. She has she has like a very Western bol- bolero jacket and shirt and necktie. And um, she's a little more she's more dolled up in and gussied up than they become more natural as the film progresses. Going to the T-shirt, but by the end of the film, she's still just in Thelma Louise. They're almost like uh, Lone Ranger and Tonto because. Louise always has those sandals, like oh, moccasin sandals, and Thelma has the cowboy boots. Oh, right, yeah. Or Louise, Louise by the end is a cowboy. She's got her hat that she bartered for, and she's added the the necktie jean jacket, strips soaked in water, and the cowboy hat. And Louise is kind of like uh, her kimasabi, but she's also becomes much, you know, with her with her t shirt and. And hat, she becomes a trucker. Yeah, that's a good point. The bar that they go to is the Silver Bullet Bar. When Louise, when uh, JD wants to ask if he could get a ride, Louise saunters into the frame and she's got a Twizzler in the, the corner of her mouth, like the man with no name, like it's a cigarello. <laughs> she she gets that more. She gets a very Western hero swagger once they uh, on the road and decided to to make their way. To, to Mexico and the whole the whole fascination throughout the, the film they are the train the railroad the sound of trains is always around so 
and, and like I said, circling the truck driver with their car, like an Indian war raid after they blow up his giant chrome penis. <laughs> I also, a couple of other things that there's a real theme of either the inversion of sexual roles or confusing gender roles with family roles or changing roles because a parent, child, wife, father, husband, they all get jumbled and reassigned in this movie a lot by action or the dialogue. Delma is very much, she's very childlike and naive at the beginning of the film. I love that, that, that bit she has of she's eating the candy bar. She keeps putting it in the fridge, like a child, like a child hiding the candy. She's not supposed to be eating or almost like she's acting like she's going to get in trouble between either Daryl or Louise. And Louise asked Delma at the beginning, is he your husband or your father? And then later Delma tells Daryl on the phone outright that he is her husband, not her father. And then tells him to go fuck himself. Yeah. And she definitely defers to Louise to, you know, Thelma definitely de defers to Louise a lot where she definitely is letting her make the decisions. Yes. So it yeah, is, she, it is very much like a child pa parent relationship until towards the end. Yeah. I well, up until, I would say up until JD steals the money because Thelma totally idolizes Louise. You know, it's very much a mother daughter relationship, even though they're like a year apart. Louise is like, get your feet off the, off the dashboard. And when she's crying, she's upset and has blood. She wipes her face down and she, she, she tries to like you would a child when she's upset in the hotel room. She's like, you know what? Why don't, why don't you go? Why don't you go take a swim? Won't that be great? And that way she can get rid of her. <laughs> so the adults, her and Jimmy, the adults can talk. So a lot of weird stuff. Like Harlan asked Delma, She's like, oh, your name's Harlan? I have an uncle named Harlan. He's like, oh, is he a funny uncle? <laughs> Jeez. That's so creepy. Yeah, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of versions of roles, of, you know, either with family of confusion. There's a lot of stuff where the adults are acting childish or being childish, and that goes across the board. When JD's in the hotel room with her, when they do that hard cut, and he's like jumping out down up and down on the bed like a six-year-old. Right. Yeah, it's just, there's a lot of stuff between... Like, children and adults acting like children the ties to that that stuff ties into there's a, a recurring theme of role playing and transformations are also a big part or concern in the film but one other thing with the because they, they play a lot with societal roles or gender roles of when men behave like children or, or women are behaving or women are acting like a man would for instance i love that shot when delma sees jd they see gd jd for the second time and he's lounging on that thing with the i don't know if it was a sink or whatever and there's the house in the background that's it's a total homage to james dean's iconic shot in the george stevens film giant and it looks beautiful because it really makes it look beautiful but thelma does that weird thing of they refuse to take him earlier in the film and they come across him again and she kind of looks at louise and she just starts doing that weird whimper like a hound oh yeah <laughs> i forgot about that yeah that was weird <laughs> yeah so i mean I, I took it as to, just to be funny but but then it also occurred to me watching this time is like well men are the ones that are typically referred to as being the hound dog or the dirty dog like chasing after the opposite sex and here is a scene where Thumb is physically doing that because she's she's begging her to pick up that hot dude by the side of the road by acting like a like an old hound dog. Oh, and to go back to what I was saying about role playing transformations, Thelma she starts off and she when they first take off she she takes a cigarette which is not lit and plays act that she's smoking a cigarette and Louise like what are you and she's like I'm Louise like she physically pretends to be <laughs> louise so she pretends to be her and then the funny part is that once she has good sex and once she discovers that jd has stolen her money and fucked her fucked her over and louise falls apart and it, it's almost like when a kid sees like mommy or daddy crying and they're like oh fuck like i gotta fix this you know what i mean yeah and that's what happens and she all of a sudden's like don't worry about it i'm gonna fix it and then she's the one yelling at her like, come on we gotta go and she told they totally switch roles where she takes control and takes reign because of what happened and when she sees louise lose it She's like, well, I, I have to step up. And she was drinking before that. But then after that is when you see her drinking and she actually smokes. Okay. Huh. But yeah. And JD, you know, in terms of role playing, JD pretends that he's pretending to be a college student needing a ride. And then he tells Thelma, there's one line that really stood out to me. He tells Thelma in, when they're at the Vagabond Hotel and he's jumping up and down, like I said, like the little kid. And she's like, she's like, oh, come on, son. She's like, who, who, who are you? And he says, I'm the great and powerful Oz. Who do you want to be? <laughs> so it, it kind of stuck out. It's like that one little line, which I've seen many times. It's like, oh, it's like you can reinvent yourself. You can be whoever you want to be. I have great powerful laws. And then, you know, I could be a convenience store robber. And then he even play acts using the, the hair dryer as an ersatz gun to show her the technique and stuff like that. So so it's pretty layered. That stuff is it, it, it comes up a lot. And 
the characters, I mean, they really change in the course of like four or five days. Yeah, they go through a lot. They go through a hell of a lot. Yeah. And going back to uh, there's transformations and it's also tied to something with Louise's trauma that she experienced that she refuses to actually speak to anyone even Thelma about when you, you see that article you pointed out to me, the two people were talking about like, Oh, look at how differently they're packing. And at the very beginning of the film, you see that Louise is her fastidiousness is almost psychotic, where she's got to put everything in the Ziploc bags and she has to clean that one glass perfectly and leave it. And that article you sent me, they, they were just, they took it as, Oh, her, her life is so empty that she has to do that. And I'm like, no, I think they got that all wrong. I think the fastidiousness in Louise is this desire to be clean, like almost like a Lady Macbeth kind of thing. Like okay. This, this thing, this thing happened to traumatic thing happened to her. She feels dirty and sullied. And so she's when Harvey Keitel's character Slocum breaks into her house, they even have a shot of him running his fingers over her table. And they, she hasn't been there in days. And it's spotless. Right. There's a lot of, so, and it's also, a lot, there's a lot of water imagery in this film. You ever know, you notice that. The, that I didn't it, catch. It's constantly raining when it's not super sunny. There, there's a lot of water image imagery where when Thelma first bumps into J, to Brad Pitt, JD's character, I don't know what the fuck he's doing, but it looks like he's just ejaculating water everywhere because she bumps into him. It's just like, I don't know what he was doing with this rubber hose of water at the gas station. <laughs> but, uh, people are, are in the rain or getting caught in the rain or running through the rain a lot. In a scene in the hotel, Louise taking in showers. And at one shot, when they go to the roadside gas station bathroom, and when Louise sees that tiny speck of Harlan's blood on her cheek and she flips out. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you have something there. By the way, I just want to mention, uh, there's an article that Pat and I have mentioned sharing. Uh, I'll put it in the show notes. It's a pretty pretty intense review of of Thelma and Louise. No, I was going to say, it's a, like a five-part series. And I think they did it, the people who did it, did it as they were watching the film. So I'll add that in the show notes. It's pretty yeah, interesting. Yeah, definitely. It, I, I enjoyed it. I like the handoff between reviewers. It's very fun. And they're very funny. They've got a lot of observations. Go back to the transformations and the cleanliness thing. But you know who has, you know who has the most to create, you know who has the, the fastest transformation? Is that that Nazi state trooper? Huh. When they're pulled to the side by him towards the end of the film, and he's got the mirrored glasses, and Louis's like, "Oh my God, he's a Nazi!" And he's all like super stern, super macho. Right. And then within like two minutes, he's reduced to a blubbering, crying, <laughs> pleading for his life, baby. Yeah, that's a good point. Huh. And that, by the way, was that was that comical transformation is the quickest one in the film. But that was the actor Jason Beggy. Or beg B E G H E. That was all his idea to be reduced to this puddle of a man after starting off like he's like Johnny Law. Oh, that's funny. That is a good call on his part. Yeah. Oh no, it totally works. It's very funny, and it, it works thematically with the stuff going on in the, the film. And there is a couple of things that are. I, I almost think they're like visual asides or. or contemplations that I talked about when Louise sees the two old women. There's a. I don't know if you caught this, but. When Louise refuses to pick JD up the first time, she's like, probably not a good idea. She gets in the car and she's like all super cool. And she just fucking guns the, the car full speed in, in reverse and goes backwards straight into the, the gas station. And they're talking in the corner. Did you catch that? There's some totally random. It's it's like cartoonish machismo of commentary. There's this total Venice Beach, Muscle Beach dude with headphones on, tight shorts, and like a, a muscle shirt. And he's like a big like wrestler dude. And he's just doing curls. Oh, yeah. I did barbells. catch that. <laughs> I, I remember thinking at the time, like, what the hell is that guy? Doing? What the hell is with that guy? <laughs> and, and yeah. And the fact that no, like nothing's done with it. It's just it's just like, no, that dude, that dude just happens to work out right there at the gas station. <laughs> So great. <laughs> oh, one thing I wanted to mention, I, I'm i sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. This should have been, come up earlier. I was really amazed by how unfazed the waitress was when Hal Slocum, Harvey Keitel, is interviewing her. And she's just like, yeah, Harlan's dead. 
Uh, yeah. Not only is she unfazed, there was some criticism about how Thelma's character could be okay and have sex with JD or be excited by him. But she's not the only one. Not only is she unfazed or doesn't give a fuck about what happened to Harlan because she's like, whatever. I hope it's his wife. I'm the one that hope did it. She's telling the audience, like, this guy was a fucking asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew him. She probably grew up and went to school with him and could give a fuck that he died. She's like, surprised it didn't happen sooner. You're right. And, but the best part is the int the even more interesting part is she's using the opportunity to try and kick it to Slocum. She's like, Oh, you just kept me out. You're not going to have a drink or like, come on. You, <laughs> you just want to see dumb questions about that asshole. The girls are on the make in this movie. They don't care. <laughs> They're like, I got, I got stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> it, it's funny though. It's just like Harlan was not going to be missed. <laughs> like, no, I mean, and I think it comes, I forget, it's either, it's close to the a shot of classic Ridley Scott, it's night, the concrete is wet, so it reflects different lights, there's smoke, zip up the, the body bag. She's like, yep, he deserved it. <laughs> really? You're not going to get a drink with me? You're missing out, Harvey Keitel. <laughs> yeah, no, she was great. Uh, he's, I, I, I didn't, I haven't seen J. Jane, I, I believe she's a gnat, and she seems to have been in many films after that, but that part i got a kick yeah i thought it was pretty funny i i should have mentioned it earlier i just i just thought of it now it's like yeah that was great the reviews were had people loving it or downright pissed off the needle was swinging so far uh, across but and both male and female critics were vehemently praising it or panning it the critical and cultural debate and the controversy that this film created and engendered is really fascinating and, and i think it's a really big part of the whole mystique and the reputation that the film has in pop culture consciousness even today especially uh, today and it continues it, it is an important part of discussing the film is just how much just how much people were really up in arms and debating it yeah and i think still to this day they still do i mean it's still it's still a movie you could you could talk to non-movie people about it and they'll they'll have an opinion about it. No, definitely. I mean, you had Janet Maislin, New York Times, loved it and thought it was great. Roger Ebert. Then there were those that felt it had strong feminist overtones. Kenneth Turan called it a neo-feminist road movie. But then you had the flip side where you even you had people, you had critics claiming that it wasn't, that wasn't the case. In her essay, The Daughters of Thelma Louise, Jessica Envold argued that the film is an attack on the conventional patterns of show chauvinist male behavior towards females in addition it exposes the traditional stereotyping of male female relationships uh, and L los angeles film critic sheila benson said that uh, objected to the characterization of the film as feminist arguing that it's more preoccupied with revenge and violence than feminist values it, it the list goes on and on but it was such a big deal that this movie Thelma louise made the cover of time magazine on june 24 1991 and on the cover it said why Thelma louise strikes a nerve and i i told you offhand but i it took me four hours if not more to find my copy for this <laughs> for this recording but the interesting thing is that the main article was written by richard Schickel, who wrote the autobiography of clint eastwood that we discussed in our outlaw josie wales podcast oh wow okay and some might think oh well he probably didn't like it his article was Gender bender over Thelma Louise. A white hot debate rages over whether Thelma and Louise celebrates liberated females, male bashers, or outlaws. And he he starts off the article with you know giving you a, a taste of the different kind of things being said. It is a pan to transformative violence, an explicit fascist theme, a small hearted, extremely toxic film about as morally and intellectually screwed up as Hollywood could get. And that was written by social commentator John Leo for U.S. News and World Report. It justifies armed robbery, manslaughter, chronic drunken driving exercises, and consciousness-raising charges. New York Daily News columnist Richard Johnson. And again, then to Sheila Benson uh, said that it has has to do with response, has little to do with responsibility, equality, sensitivity, understanding, not revenge, retribution, or sadistic behavior. It just went on and on. But his take was that Thelma Louise is a movie whose scenes and themes lend themselves to provocative discussions, and it, it did so in 1991. And... I learned looking at things for this podcast still does today because he defended it. He thought that for the most part, the gist of his, his article was that those, those people that were really getting upset were missing the point. And he quelled a lot of what male bashing criticisms leveled at the film and that it supported uh, violence. So basically Schickel was 
was saying what you and I have been talking about and agree that it, it remains an intriguing movie back then and stirs imagine stirs one's critical imagination and it continues to do so in the same time magazine they also had a woman a female critic margaret colson say is this her article was is this what feminism is all about by playing out a male fantasy thelma louise shows hollywood is still a man's world so it was a big deal then and it still is i mean the sexual politics and or the perceived sexual politics made this film the zeitgeist that it was. And I came across that for the 25th anniversary, Kyle Smith, the New York Post, did an article for the for the anniversary that said, as a feminist film, Thelma Louise fails miserably. And at around the same time, Harper's Bazaar had a celebratory 25th anniversary celebration lauding in his groundbreaking. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy. I, I am more of the in the Richard Chickle camp. Yeah, I would be too. I'd agree with that. And Gina Davis points out something that for all this talk and bluster about how awful it is, and every, she points out that three people die in this movie, and two of them are Thelma and Louise. <laughs> right. It's considered a great movie. It won won Oscars. It, it won Oscar for Best Screenplay. Category won a Golden Globe. Writers Guild Award. Rotten Tomatoes, it's 85%. Tomato meter, 7.5 out of 10 on IMDb. So it's still considered a good, a very good film. And and I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. It, and it holds up. I, I mean, I think a lot of the points it makes are still as relevant today as when it came out. But that's interesting because you, you hadn't seen it before. So seeing it 30 years later, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But yeah, there's so much. This this movie, it's such a, it's a lot of fun. I think if we haven't seen it and we ruined some things for you, I'm sorry, but you should definitely see it if you haven't seen it. There's a couple of things I wanted to say. It's funny, the marketing campaign for this movie is so bizarre because I, I've been driving myself crazy trying to find, I have this old video store standee that I loved and I don't know what I did with the fucking thing. But I also, last night I came across, I, I have the original press kit for the film and I wow. may have the poster. But the marketing for this film is the one thing that I was like, wow this is really shitty you see this movie you know what the you know what the 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 tagline of the poster was no idea it said somebody said get a life so they did jesus (laughs) my god isn't that the shittiest thing you ever fucking heard (laughs) that that would not make me want to see this movie i i mean i mean the fucking marketing department really should be ashamed about that one. It is so fucking bad. It's not what the movie is about at all. No. They did this, this company did this really beautiful poster that came out like a year after. It was very limited and it was very retro. It was done the way like 30s posters were done. It looks great. So much better. The tagline is that and for the day put on that poster is one of the lines that is one of my favorite lines of the film. It's just Louise at some point says to Thelma, you get what you settle for. And that's the tagline they use that. And that line is so simple and yet it's so insightful. I, I think those words those are words to truly live by, in my opinion. You get what you settle for. Because it's true. Yeah, totally true. Yeah, that's much better. Wow. That's uh I yeah, I did not know that was the tagline, the original <laughs> one. That is ha- horrible. There is one other thing that I Callie Corey says something in the audio commentary, and I think it's very great, and I just wanna add this. I, I have so much to say, but I I feel like I've been you know, I've, oral diarrhea this entire podcast but <laughs> no it's been great Callie Corey said in the audio commentary it was the most liberating thing that ever happened to me and it untied me from every bit of insecurity or fear I had ever had in my life about trying to accomplish something all of a sudden I felt if you can think it you can do it that became true and that changed my life I, I thought that was awesome and and I think it's very inspiring for for everyone yeah I, I thought it's very cool yeah very cool because uh, for me, while this movie is about women and, and it's about women finding their power, and, and I agree 100 percent, but I took it to where it was inspiring for everyone, in my opinion. That's what that's what I really connected with. Yeah, I think it's a great movie. I, I, was a, I had a really good time watching it. Definitely going to watch it again. You brought up a lot of stuff that I missed. <laughs> so I've seen usual. it. I, but I, to be fair, to be fair, I've seen it many more times than you. Right. <laughs> One other final thought I wanted to bring up to you. Are you aware of the Bechtel test or the Bechtel-Wallace test? I am aware of it, but maybe you should explain what it is. Sure. Okay, so Alison Bechtel had this strip, and uh, we when I, when I worked at Samaritan Comics, we sold a lot of these. It was very popular. It was a strip called Dykes to Watch Out For. And, and one of those strips, 
it has two women who are talking and one states that she only sees a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements and then states the three rules. One, it has to have at least two named women in it. Two, who talk to each other. Three, about something besides a man. This film, I believe, certainly passes the Bechdel Wallace test. Yeah. Dump Louise. Because they, well, it, they do talk about men a lot. There are lots of conversations where a man does not come into it. The other thing I wanted to say that's very interesting to me is that in the original strip, the the woman replies. She's talking. The two women are talking. She explains the three rules, and one one woman says something along the lines like, "Oh, it's pretty strict rules." And the woman who's described what it is says, "No kidding. The last movie I was able to see was Alien." Wow. <laughs> so Ridley Scott did it at least twice, people. At least twice. And it's even in the original strip. That's pretty cool. Just want to make sure I mention that for this podcast. So you want to, you think we should wrap things up then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, that's all the time that we have. Want to join the conversation? Come and visit us at the cinephiliaclounge.com. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, where we're the Cinephiliac. And on Twitter, you can find us at the Cinephiliac1. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we will discuss Denise Villeneuve's sci fi film, Arrival. Thank you so much. Looking forward to that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>